Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we are with us Dr. Sheila Jacoby, an assistant professor at The Ohio State University. So Dr. Jacoby, before we start, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Clayton, for having me today. Um, so my background is I grew up in a small town in southern Indiana and uh, did my undergraduate at Purdue in animal science where I got exposed to beef and swine research. I actually got my master's at the University of Nebraska in, um, in ruminant nutrition and then came back to Purdue and got my PhD in swine um, nutrition. Really focused around adipocyte physiology or fat cell physiology and how it regulates overall energy metabolism in the animal um, from a growth and health perspective. And then I uh, went on to North Carolina State and um, did a postdoc in uh, early uh, pagolic nutrition and have continued on that as, um, as an assistant professor here at Ohio State, really focused in on how nutrients impact gut health and overall um, growth and developmental biology of the animal. Gotcha. So on that, I read that summary you sent me about the microbiota gut-brain access, access and how it could have an effect on the physiological, immunological, and neurological status of pigs. So would you mind telling us a little bit about the work that you've been doing there? Sure. So we have um, a significant focus in my lab right now looking at how nutrition impacts the microbiota, so changing the microbiota communities, as well as how those changes in microbial communities impact the host. So what is happening from the standpoint of gut health is how I really got interested in this, but then it expanded beyond gut health to how it signals to the brain and the brain back to the gut to maintain optimal GI tract health. Um, I work with a collaborator in food science here at Ohio State who has an interest in lactic acid bacteria and um, other products from the dairy industry that could be used in nutrition from an animal or human standpoint. And he had a library of 130 some probiotics that he was looking at and we started to genome sequence those and look at what is their um, application in a probiotic standpoint. And the reason we went down the genome sequencing pathway is because uh, I brought to that conversation that a lot of the neurotransmitters that are produced in the body start from the microbes in the gut. And that neurotransmitter communication not only affects um, development of the gut and motility of the gut, but also signals to the enteric nervous system through um, and back to the vagal nervous system, so all the way to the brain, on how that animal is interpreting stress in the brain and what are the feedback signals from the brain um, that regulate stress. And in addition to stress, how it's regulating feed intake. We have centers in our brain that allow us to determine what our energy status is. So if we have um, health issues or stress issues, we can downregulate our feed intake centers because there's a communication, a bidirectional communication between the centers of our brain that regulate stress and the centers of our brain that regulate feed intake. Well, in food production and in particular swine production, that's really important. There are specific stages of production that induce more stress than others. And we know in particular weaning stress causes animals to go off feed in the first um, few days, probably 48 hours to 72 hours, those animals can go off feed. We also know that that's when opportunistic pathogens can take hold in the GI tract and cause diarrheal diseases in those animals, which further um, uh, mitigates the challenges that we have with gut health and efficient use of nutrients early in life. So the thought was we have all this information about probiotics, we have these libraries of probiotics, now, how do we figure out what the optimal um, concentration of those uh, probiotics that should be fed that actually get to the GI tract past the stomach and can mitigate some of the issues that we see with um, stress and disease in the gut and gut health of piglets? So after doing some screening, really what we were looking for is what probiotics have the enzymes capable of taking um, compounds like tryptophan and converting that to serotonin or the enzyme systems that convert glutamine uh, to glutamate. And how are those affecting the neurological circuitry in the gut, but also systemically in that pig to allow that um, animal to utilize those nutrients, 
make an end substrate that is regulating the neurological circuitry in that animal to change the stress levels, hopefully decreasing stress levels while increasing feed intake at times when those animals are um, under uh, stress because of changes in their production system or because of health. So from that, we started screening probiotics. We've come down to six. We've actually doing mostly in vitro work right now, looking using a piglet intestinal cell line. And we're looking at how the probiotic interacts with the um, intestinal barrier function in vitro. So we have data showing that the probiotic will actually bind to the epithelial barrier, that it will inhibit the binding of enterotoxigenic E. coli that was isolated from um, nursery pigs that have diarrheal disease, and that we can not damage the health of the cell and enhance um, barrier function through um, proteins called tight junctions that help maintain gut health. So preliminarily, that's where we are. We've also started measuring the levels of neurotransmitters that are being secreted and how that affects challenge in this in vitro system. And further, we're going to look at um, in vitro digestion to look at the stability of the probiotic through different portions of the GI tract before um, moving into a secondary study. Gotcha. So you mentioned um, the stability at one point there. So what do you think are some of the main concerns about the efficacy of using probiotics? Do you think it's affected um, a lot by the stability when it moves through the low pH in the stomach? Or is it more dependent on like the current intestinal health of the pig? Um, it probably is some of both. Uh, yeah, most things in biology, it's not one, one or the other. Um, but we do know we have preliminary data screening through acid tolerance that would suggest that the low pH in the stomach is going to reduce if you feed, for example, if, you, if you're if you feeding, say, 10 to the 7th or something, colony-forming units, we know that the survivability of that through a pH 2 to 3 um, really decreases uh, the, the efficacy or the livability of that probiotic through that acid condition. So one thing is, is how much do you need to get through that acid condition so that when you get to a less acid condition, can they proliferate again in that environment? That That's probably one challenge we have with efficacy. Um, the other, I think, is what is the health of the GI tract? So overall bacterial communities or microbiota communities are going to play a role in this. So do you have high pathogen load in the GI tract versus a normal diverse microbiota, which would, we would consider, I guess, healthy at this stage by our understanding? What is, what is the application um, when you have those differences? If it's a healthy condition and you're just trying to mitigate stressors or enhance GI health, Maybe that efficacy is can, is is less um, obvious when you look at phenotypic output in a production system. Um, in a health situation challenge, then hopefully, if you have higher pathogen loads, um, that efficacy is more obvious by the number of bacteria. But I think we're still in the infancy of understanding that. Um, which is which is it? Is it the stability of getting through the GI tract and then proliferating again? Or is it the community of microbes, whether there's higher pathogens or higher diversity of normal microbes that are going to impact that probiotic efficacy long term? Gotcha. And as going on that with furthering our understanding, since we're kind of still within the infancy, the beginning steps of that. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate you coming on here to share everything with me and everyone else. Thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swinenit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.